On the 18th of May 2012, the day before Chelsea won their first Champions League title, N'Golo Kante made his debut for US Bologna as a 21-year-old as the club, based in the north of France, were relegated from Ligue 2. From that disappointing start, Kante's rise has been nothing short of miraculous, as he earned a move first to Caen, then Leicester City and finally Chelsea, winning two Premier League titles, an FA Cup, the Europa League and most recently the Champions League. Not only that, but after finally establishing himself at an international level with France in 2016, he helped Le Bleu to the final of the Euros that summer and won his nation's second ever World Cup two years later. For a player deemed not good enough by a host of clubs and Claire Fontaine, the French National Youth Academy, Kante has managed to become one of the defining players of this generation. Whilst his shy, humble and low-key nature, summed up by playing FIFA and watching Match of the Day with complete strangers in King's Cross in 2018, has won him legions of fans worldwide. But who is N'Golo Kante and what makes him so special? Today on FD Explains, we aim to find out. Born in Paris at the end of March 1991, N'Golo Kante, named after the 18th century king N'Golo Diara of the Bambara Empire, now modern-day Mali, wasn't earmarked for greatness immediately. It was football that got Kante through a tough start in life. Born to Malian parents in the suburbs of Paris, the diminutive midfielder was one of nine children, and after losing his father at the age of 11, he dedicated himself to football and self-improvement. Told in his youth that his weaker left foot was letting him down by former youth coach Piotr Wojtyna, he went away and worked relentlessly on it, and within two months was capable of juggling a football more than a hundred times using only his left. But this motivation and relentless work ethic wasn't yielding a place in an academy. Rejected from clubs including Rennes, Sochaux, Amiens, Lorient and the aforementioned Claire Fontaine, it wasn't until Kante was 19 that he was finally signed by Bologna. It would be easy to blame these knockbacks on his height but Kante himself isn't sure. Speaking in 2016, he said, There were plenty of opportunities at the trials, but whether I was too young, hadn't developed or just wasn't ready, I don't know. Up to that point, he had been playing in the 8th tier with local team Suresnes, where the promise of watching Kante would yield an extra 50 fans on match day. But despite turning professional with Bologna, Kante was still sceptical about his ability to make it in the game, and earned a diploma in accounting as a backup at this time. A devout Muslim whose faith is enormously important to him, Kante lived a low-key lifestyle off the pitch, only buying his first car, a second-hand Renault, when his mother tired of taxing him about. Whilst he still drives a Mini Cooper today, rare for a footballer earning a reported £290,000 per week. His former teammate Cedric Fabien told 442 of his character, He's very, very calm, a great guy, and he doesn't speak a lot. It's a good mentality. But whilst his life off the pitch was decidedly normal, he was beginning to make waves on it. Following a spell with the reserves with whom he helped to promotion, he was finally given his chance with the first team in the third tier of French football. As with all the teams he represents, he instantly improved them, and it didn't take long for Ligue 2 club Cannes to spot his potential and sign him on a free in August 2013. The results were instantaneous, as Kante lifted Cannes to third place in 2013-14 and promotion to Ligue 1 for just the fifth time this century. And Kante, who stars himself on former Real Madrid midfielder Lasana Diara, immediately made an impression. He scored two and assisted five in 37 league art games that season, but it was his otherworldly defensive output that truly caught the eye. He completed the fifth most interceptions in the entire division, whilst his 176 tackles was not only the most in France, but 14 more than the next most in Europe, Napoli's Alain. Cannes finished up 13th, their second best placing since the mid 90s. But surprisingly, there was very little attention on Kante. But Leicester City scout Steve Walsh had been watching, and the Foxes swooped to sign him practically unopposed for £6 million in August 2015. With more interest generated by the signings of Stokes' Rob Huth and Shinji Okazaki, who arrived with a large reputation forged in the Bundesliga, very few people took much notice of Kante when he pitched up at the King Power. But it didn't take long for the watching world to wake up to his abilities, as he led 5,000 to 1 Leicester City to the Premier League title, in quite possibly the most unlikely and remarkable sporting story of all time. Kante was magnificent, a bustling ball of energy and tenacity, who earned not only himself a move to Chelsea, but also his midfield partner Danny Drinkwater, a move that has aged terribly. Praise for Kante that season came from all angles. Sir Alex Ferguson called the then 25-year-old by far the best player in the Premier League this season. And it's not difficult to see why. The numbers were startling. He completed 156 interceptions and 175 tackles, both the most in Europe, the only time one player has topped both metrics in the last 10 years. Chelsea jumped at the opportunity to sign him for £30 million. Leicester's then record sale. 
And Kante's rise from the 8th tier of French football to one of Europe's most prestigious clubs in just five years was complete. But he wasn't done there. Far from being overawed by the step up in quality at Chelsea, Kante continued to earn rave reviews for his performances. After converting Leicester from relegation candidates to Premier League champions after his arrival with a 40-point swing, he repeated the trick at Chelsea, taking them from 10th in 2015-16 to the title in his debut campaign, with 43 more points than the season prior. What was even more telling was the fact that the season after his departure from the Midlands, Leicester with the same back five, Drinkwater, Mares, and Vardy, finished 12th with 44 points. It's not crazy to assume, therefore, that Kante had a pretty large say in both clubs' undulating fortunes. By now, commentators and pundits were running out of superlatives to describe his boundless energy and razor-sharp anticipation, and all four managers he has worked under in West London have made him the centrepiece of their sides. His first three years at Chelsea yielded three trophies, two Blues Player of the Years and a PFA Player of the Year award in 2016-17. But it hasn't always been simple for Kante. Now 30, he has seen his body catch up with his relentless work ethic and niggling injuries have become commonplace, with the Frenchman missing 31 games with 9 separate issues since the start of 2019-20. But it hasn't only been these enforced spells on the sidelines that have affected Kante. With his brother having died tragically of a heart attack shortly before the 2018 World Cup, and his image rights agent Nuri Gahari taken to court over alleged fraud and a breach of trust, the midfielder has had an incredibly challenging few years off the pitch. And for a time, he even faced question marks over his place in Chelsea's starting eleven. After being moved from his defensive midfield position by Maurizio Sarri to accommodate new signing Jorginho throughout the 2018-19 campaign, Kante's form no doubt affected by frequent injuries, which included playing through the pain of a serious knee injury in the 2019 Europa League final, suffered the following season under Frank Lampard. He was only fit enough to start 20 Premier League games, ranking 10th in the squad for minutes, and his ability to get around the pitch and break up play was clearly hampered, as he completed just 2.3 tackles per 90, down from 3.6 in his maiden campaign with the Blues. But Thomas Tuchel's arrival in January 2021 changed everything. With the team looking increasingly bereft of ideas and attack and poorly structured defensively by the end of Frank Lampard's reign, the Germans' arrival saw the club revert to the 3-4-2-1 formation that had been so effective under Antonio Conte. Injured with a hamstring issue when he arrived, people might be surprised to find out that Kante only played 39% of the available league minutes until the end of the season, as Chelsea stumbled across the line in fourth. But the former Dortmund and PSG boss who claimed he dreamt of managing Kante before taking the helm at Chelsea knew the value of keeping the Frenchman fit for the biggest games. His strategy more than came off in the Champions League, as Kante put in one of the strongest runs of consecutive games from a midfielder in the competition's history, as Chelsea vanquished the Spanish champions, 13-time European champions and Premier League champions to win their second European Cup, with Kante winning the Man of the Match award in both legs of the semi-final and the final. In the process, Kante became just the sixth player in the sport's illustrious history to win the Champions League, Premier League and World Cup. What was most impressive about his performances, though, was that it wasn't his traditional strengths that shone. Playing in front of the excellent Jorginho, Kante's role was to pressure opponents into submission and then quickly evade pressure. With his role in Timo Werner's goal against Real Madrid at Stamford Bridge the best example of this, as he sidestepped Casemiro and dragged Nacho out of position for Chelsea's first. Coming up against Real Madrid and Man City's star-studded midfields, Tuchel knew he had the advantage, saying, If you play with Kante, you have half a man more. A familiar concept to Eden Hazard, who said playing with Kante was like playing with twins. By the latter stages of the tournament, this more than rang true, as Kante was quite simply becoming close to the perfect midfielder. Completing six dribbles, one more than Pulisic against Real in Spain, and then five interceptions and three key passes in the return leg at the bridge. In the final, his 10 ball recoveries played a crucial role in vanquishing Pep's Man City, a side that finished 19 points above Chelsea last season. The Blues limited them to just 0.45 xG and one shot on target, with Kante everywhere all the time. But it wasn't just his defensive work. He finished the tournament with 32 take-ons with a 72% success rate, far ahead of the likes of Foden, Kingsley Coman and Neymar with their box of tricks. Kante was now being talked about as a potential Ballon d'Or winner, and if he wins his second successive international tournament this summer, he'll no doubt be the favourite. Just this week, his importance to the national team was shown by Didier Deschamps claiming it was N'Golo Kante who was the first name on the team sheet, whilst French President Emmanuel Macron has said he thinks the superstar deserves the Ballon d'Or. Adored by all, not least as teammates, for his faultless attitude and simple love of the game, rather than getting swept up in the glamour that comes with it, 
Kante, a force of nature, is without doubt in the conversation for the best Premier League midfielder of all time, alongside the Lampards, Vieiras, Scholes and Gerrards. His role might have changed over the years, but it has become increasingly apparent in the last six months that N'Golo Kante can quite simply do it all. He is the midfield. For a player born into hardship, ignored by the elite and only picked up at the age of 19, that's quite a turnaround. So guys, that was our FD Explains on the rise of N'Golo Kante. What did you guys think of it and who do you want to see us cover next on the Rise of series on FD Explained? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to click on screen for another great Football Daily video and I will catch you next time.